Welcome everybody. Good evening uh, or good afternoon, depending on uh, which part of the country you're joining us from tonight. Um, very excited to have you all join us here for our Geography of Hope episode presented by Alaska Wilderness League. For those of you that uh, don't know me or haven't been to one of our Geography of Hopes before, my name is Monica Shear. I'm the Director of Outreach here at Alaska Wilderness League. And I'm coming to you tonight from southeastern Pennsylvania, the traditional territories of the Lenape people. And I'm so thrilled uh, to see so many of you uh, have joined us for tonight's event with Princess Dajra Johnson, uh, a Gwich'in writer, director, producer, actor, advocate, um, so many accolades <laughs> and amazing talents uh, behind her. And uh, while all our Geography of Hope episodes are a small way for us to show our, our appreciation to all of our league supporter donors and, and volunteers, I'm particularly glad uh, so many of you joined us for tonight's discussion, which I know will um, you'll find both informative and empowering uh, because we're gonna get to hear about Princess's inspiration for storytelling and get her perspective on human interactions with plants and animals and the land and water that we all depend upon and how it's really um, <clears throat> brought about uh, a lot of her work. So we have a few more episodes uh, left this season uh, in our Geography of Hope. So always keep an eye out for your email. We'll be inviting you to join the next one uh, in a few short weeks. And then before I formally introduce tonight's featured guest, um, just a few quick housekeeping items to help you get the most from tonight's program. As you can see, all participants will be muted for the duration of the program to help assure everyone has the best listening experience possible. Princess and I will be having a conversation and we've allowed plenty of time to field questions from the audience during our Q&A at the end. So please type in any questions you might have um, in the chat at any point this evening and we'll be sure to get to them. If for any reason you miss part of tonight's program or you want to listen again or you want to share that program, with your friends and family, it is being recorded and we will be sending you a link to the full recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. And speaking of that follow-up email, please do keep an eye out for it. Uh, in the chat tonight, you will see some links and information being shared by my colleague, Lois. We're gonna include all of that in that follow-up email. So no worries if you're either joining us by phone tonight or don't wanna take the time about copying the links, you will be getting them uh, tomorrow along with the recording. Uh, and with that, I'm so pleased to welcome Princess, um, who lives on the traditional territories of the Lower Tanana Denene lands in Alaska and is committed to building a more narrative sovereignty for other Alaska Native filmmakers and in seeing a just transition off fossil fuels. Uh, she serves on the Board of Native Movement, NDN Collective, and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, to go on top of all of her other achievements and talents I listed above. Princess received a bachelor's degree in international relations from the George Washington University and a master's degree in education um, at the University of Alaska Anchorage with a focus on environmental and science education. She has served on the SAG AFTRA Native American Committee since 2007 and was appointed by President Obama in 2015 to serve on the board of trustees for the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, she is a Sundance Film alum, a Nia Tarot Storytelling Fellow, and a creative producer and screenwriter for the Peabody Award-winning PBS kids series, Molly of Denali, which we'll be talking more about this evening. And so with that, I am so pleased uh, for all of you joining us tonight and welcome, Princess. Masicho, Monica. Um... Shalaknai, Shojri Dajayo, Jini, it's Igwich and Ihi, Shiahanai Catherine, a Stephen Peter, Oji Gabakwa, Shahan Atlines, a Shiti Ernest, Raybop Oji Gabakwa, Nets Igwich and Ihi, Jukdrin Sho Ihi, Monica Masit for that um, lovely introduction and for inviting me to be a part of this series. I love geography and I love hope. And so geography of hope, I was like, what? <laughs> you had me at that title. <laughs> um, so my name is Princess Dajai Johnson and um, 
I am Netzai Guchin. My um, grandparents came from Bashranko or Arctic Village, Alaska. Um, on my father's side, I am also um, Ashkenazi Jewish, and um, I live here on Lower Tanana Dene lands um, in Fairbanks, Alaska, with um, my husband and my three boys and my two dogs and my bunny. <laughs> Um, and I love that um, I'm not seeing everybody's screen, but one of the first screens that popped up was an old friend, um, Miho. So hi, Miho. So good to see you. Um, yeah, just really jazzed to, to be here with you all. Well, thank you um, for that. And so tonight, you know, just so as, as folks know, I'm really excited because we get to talk about not only some of your film projects, but also about representation in media and the power of storytelling, which is really what a lot of this geography of hope and, and our whole series is centered around is just the ability and the power of the word to really share um, and convey information and emotion and get folks excited and um, interested in learning. Um, so with that, I thought we'd kick it off because I, I feel that everyone has a different sense when they hear the word representation and what it means to them. And particularly, um, there's likely many of us like myself that didn't have to necessarily think about it, or it wasn't an active part of, of us kind of growing up. And it's only been lately as we've learned a lot more and have been, um, you know, really interested and focused on trying to improve ourselves that we've come to uh, realize our experience obviously was not the same for everyone. So just wanted to really give you a chance to talk a little bit about representation and how it's um, what it's meant to you and how it's inspired some of your work. Yeah, I mean, one of the you know things that really sticks out to me um, in my childhood growing up here in Alaska was, and I was I lived you know I had a really transient childhood. You know, my family I went up I was in Anchorage, I was in Fairbanks, I spent summers with my grandmother up in um, Wichita and Fort Yukon. Um, but in my time in the public school system and in these big cities, um, I felt pretty invisibilized as an Alaska Native person. Um, and there was a lot of um, just, you know, I grew up experiencing a lot of racism, microaggressions. Um, so on top of that, not seeing anything in the city that was an acknowledgement of the first peoples that were there, whether it be Anchorage or Fairbanks, um, really, you know, added to um, this sense of being less than um, and, and had such a an, an big impact on, on my self-esteem as a child and through my teenage years. And so to be at this place where we are finally um, acknowledging and doing away with racist mascots um, that we're getting to see accurate and positive and beneficial um, representation in, in film and in television, in the media, et cetera. Um, I don't think we can underscore the impact that has um, on our children's self-esteem and just really um, normalizing acceptance, inclusion, compassion. Um, and yeah, so I think that, you know, again, you know, to finally be at this stage where, where we're seeing um, more inclusion and representation is, um, it's critical to, I think, our growth as human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you and I got an opportunity to speak earlier, we, we talked a little bit about the shift that we're seeing. Um, it's exciting to see, as you mentioned, with the mascots and representation in film, uh, ways to go, but uh, I'm excited because some of your projects are helping us in that shift and get us a little further down. Um, but also you had mentioned storytelling and really growing up around storytellers and in this kind of sense of the importance of, of story and um, how that also shapes. So in, in conjunction with the representation, how, how did that really help formulate your background? Um, well, of course, um, I, I come from um, a community where the oral storytelling tradition is how um, knowledge was relayed. Um, our traditional knowledge, our, our knowledge of genealogy, um, our knowledge of who we are, our value systems, our, our songs, our dances, um, 
And the beautiful thing, you know, and I'm not a fluent which in speaker, I'm doing my little daily lessons <laughs> and doing my best to be an adult learner of the language. But one of the beautiful things um, about the which in language is that is it is incredibly rich in in metaphor and simile. And um, it was intentionally that way because the idea is to spark the imagination and the creativity of the listener um, when you're listening to a story. Um, you know, we come from people that had to um, survive, of course, very harsh, intense Arctic conditions for thousands of years. And so we were always looking for solutions, right? We we're always like, figuring out a way to like MacGyver our way out of a situation. And, um, and so, and so I think as, as human beings, like we are at our best when we're working together, um, to, to utilize these gifts that the creator gave us. And one of them being our imagination and using that to the best of our ability to find the solutions, um, that are so, needed in this moment right now as we go through you know one of the most intense transitional times um, I mean these are incredible times um, to be living in really very intense times and so um, I think we really we really need that those tools absolutely and you know with with that mention of, of imagination and evoking image um, I wanted to just kind of touch on what, when you first started getting involved of in film and your interest in film and, and imagery and relation and how we, it couples with the storytelling. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, my, my love for film, I mean, it's hard to, you know, you kind of like, you know, I'm, grew up in the 80s I and mean, I kind of grew up with like film and television, but I mean, I remember kind of like a, one moment, pivotal moment for me as a native woman was, um, I don't know if anybody remembers Slender Heart, like Val Kilmer was in that. And um, Sheila Towsey, who I consider um, a role model and a friend, and she, um, she plays a role in that film. And I remember seeing her and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what a strong native woman looks like. Like that's, you know, the, what I aspire to be. And that was the first time that I saw a native woman portrayed as a three-dimensional character and not just like this stereotypical two-dimensional, you know, um, person. And so that was a big moment for me. And I just recognize also just the gravity and the potential, the power of film and media, I mean, you have this opportunity to reach millions of people with what I think is like moving poetry at, at its best, right? Like, I think that that's, if you wanted to liken screenwriting to any other art form, I would say it's poetry. Um, and yeah, I, I remember years ago, I when I went through Sundance, I listened to a um, documentary about the late Waldo Salt um, who wrote Midnight Cowboy, and he really likened it. I mean, it's like a really relatively new art form, um, but yeah, he was likening it to poetry. I was like, yeah, because I kind of grew, grew up writing poetry too. And so, yeah, I just think that that's kind of where my love comes from. And it's just like, it's such a beautiful combination of like the written word when you, when you have dialogue and whatnot, and then the moving images. And then when you piece it all together, just like I think with any piece of art, right? Like you imbue a part of your spirit and intention um, into that piece. And I would say, you know, again, that is true of anything that we put our hands to. If you're cooking a meal, if you're writing a poem, you're writing a letter, maybe even a piece of legislation, <laughs> right? You're like trying to imbue the best intention, right? And, and always keeping in mind like, the impact and like, what is this going to mean for, you know, um, the, the audience that sees it for future generations. And there's something really beautiful as an indigenous person and cathartic about like putting um, efforts and energy into this, this process. 
So I feel like that's the perfect opening, um, speaking of your efforts and energy, um, for you to share about your latest film project. Um, and I will couple this with everyone who's joining us live tonight. You're in for a really, really special treat. It is not yet released uh, to the public, but we are going to screen uh, tonight. It's a five minute, five, six minute film that Princess did. But um, yeah, so I'll let her introduce it and then we will play it for all of you. Yeah, so um, during the pandemic, um, well, let's be real, we're still in the pandemic. <laughs> Oh goodness. Let's yeah. So um um I, and a couple of years ago, um, I got invited to be a part of this project um titled The Reciprocity Project and so I was one of maybe six other indigenous filmmakers from around the world that were asked, would you like to um make a film, a short film around this theme of reciprocity? And immediately I was like, yes, reciprocity, yes, because that's what it's all about. I mean, like so much, I think, of the systemic um, shift that we're, we're needing in, I mean, you take, right, like you take education, you take what's happening, you know, in our government, anything, right? You look at the extractive resource industry, like reciprocity, right, is like a key fundamental value that many of us hold. And so um, I was, and it was, the pen, you know, it was a pandemic and I was just like, okay, like it's gonna be really challenging, you know, making this short film during the pandemic, but um, I was all about it because um, one, I had been, I've been wanting to do something that's entirely in the Gwich'in language. And then I wanted to do something working with my community. Um, so I reached out to, I said yes, and then I reached out to um, Allison or Alicia Carlson, who is the granddaughter of um, our, our elder Trimble Gilbert, Reverend Tr Trimble Gilbert, and um, I had been wanting to work um, with Alicia for years, like she just has the best energy, she's super into our culture, and super creative. Um, and so it just worked out great. She said yes. Um, and then we got to work just really thinking about like, well, what do we want to show? Like, what do we want to, you know, share about who we are? And I think this is, and this is, you know, critical for us, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, for years, you know, I, you all know, I come from a really heavily documented um, community. And so, um, and I appreciate um, all the work of our allies uh, has been critical in, in protecting um, our ways of life, our native way of life, in particular, the Gwich'in way of life that's dependent upon the porcupine caribou herd. Um, and it's really important for us to be able to share that story from our lens, from the indigenous lens. And, um, you know, we, um, I wanted to, to make this again in the language and to really give people a sense of hope, but really underscore, I, I, in, in all my years um, of traveling to DC and lobbying and talking to people, I think one of the most challenging things was relaying our spiritual relationship. I can say that to somebody but it's a whole other thing to really encapsulate like and, and show somebody and get somebody to like viscerally understand that. Um, and so that's kind of what we were going for <laughs> um, with trying to do this, like this short film. And it just, it really, you know, we had um, uh, Trimble do the blessing. I mean, we went to him first and foremost and we we're like, please bless this project you know, please guide us, please help us um, of, you know, which he did. Um, and I think that that really shows through and we needed that community um, support, you know, to do it. And so I guess that's all I'll say. I mean, that's like a lot, <laughs> but I'm really delighted to kind of, to share this. It's not, it's doing the film festival circuit right now. So it's premiered at the Big Sky Film Festival already. It's uh, actually was just in DC at the nation's, I forget what it's called. It's like the nation's capital environmental film festival. 
Um, and it's going to be showing at Dawson City um, International Film Festival next. Um, and it has a, and then there's like a number of other festivals. And you can um, we're going to share the link for that. It's at, you can find the information at reciprocityproject.org. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like what I'll say about how this film came about. And it's titled, and I will, I'm going to do the English version, and Princess has graciously allowed me to do that, um, and she will do the Gwidget. It's titled, We Will Walk the Trail of Our Ancestors. Right, so, We Will Walk the Trail of Our Ancestors, which um, my mother watched the film, and I said, oh, we need a title. So she came up with that title. Perfect. Um, and then here, without further ado, is... Chukti <laughs>
Um, I hope you were all able to hear and enjoy that. Um, I have to say, Princess, even though I've watched it um, a time or two to get ready for this, it wasn't until you actually pointed out that it was done entirely in Gwich'in that I even realized just because it it just made it made so much sense. I don't know, like my mind hadn't um, really even noticed that very obvious point, but um, yeah, it was, it's, it's, amazing what you can do with imagery and sound and photos. Um, and you mentioned when we were talking how that film specifically is not, as you had mentioned, being heavily documented. Um, it's not It's not specific to an advocacy call. It's just to really get to the heart of the people. There's something having having grown up um, really embedded within the fight to protect the refuge and these issues that we're facing, there's something really liberating um, about just concentrating on the joy of being um, which in and the hope. I mean, we're talking about hope here. And to me, you know, that hope and, and really, you know, so much of what the short film is about is like our hope for our children and also recognizing, right? Like Trimble's speaking to all of us. We have to remember that we are teachers, whether or not, right? We um, have children of our own. We in some way, shape or form, have some knowledge that was passed down to us or that we obtained in some way that we have an obligation to share out um, the good stuff, right? The good teachings, not the bad stuff, <laughs> hopefully not the bad habits, but like all the, like the good stuff that we really want those future generations um, to, to emulate and, and, the, and in particular the values. And so I think so much of um, my work on on Molly of Denali and um, and and my current film projects, um, you know, are about the significance of sharing out how to be how to be in better relationship um, with one another, with the land, with the animals. Um, it's so critical critical. Um, oh, and I have to, hi, Helen. I just, it's hard for me to keep up with the comments. Like I'm still like, it's hard to multitask like that, but I did want to point out that the beautiful overhead imagery of the Vatsai that you saw um, was a courtesy um, of um, Florian Schultz and the Campion Foundation, who of course did the, the IMAX film. Um, and so we, it was, again, you know, we did this film during COVID time. So that's why you see us like wearing masks at some point in time. Um, so yeah, so, um, it was, it had, you know, we're still challenged by that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And before I know we teased out Molly a little bit and talking about sharing our knowledge and all of us being teachers, um, before we jump a little bit to the kind of younger generation that we can um, really steward. 
when we had that conversation, one thing about shared knowledge, it doesn't necessarily always have to be that young. And, and we were talking about how this experience of you really being able to tell the story through your lens, to control the whole process, to, to really just show what you wanted to show versus having someone come in, maybe with a storyboard, with a thought out idea um, and kind of plugging in, if you will. What, what documentarians and what filmmakers can really learn from this process and how they can be better teachers um, when they come into communities outside their own? Um, if you wanted to share. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I don't think like, I'm not opposed to creative collaboration at all. A lot of the projects that I'm working on are all about creative collaboration outside of just it being a strictly, you know, indigenous project. Um, I mean, even our short film, our cinematographer um, was not native. Um, but I think that it's critical to, um, and there's some, I will say there's some really great resources on this issue. Um, Illuminatives, if you're familiar with Illuminatives has created a really great guide, industry guide. Um, and then there's also the pathways and protocols um, document that comes out of the indigenous film office in Canada. So like, to me, it's about the way in which we partner together. And, you know, it's ideally, if um, a filmmaker, you know, is making a, a documentary and it centers in any way Indigenous people, like they really need to be seeking permission and consent to partner with Indigenous people. Um, I feel like we're kind of like, you know, be, we're the days of like just deciding that you're going to like make a movie about Gwich'in people <laughs> and then not have any Gwich'in people writing and producing and directing and whatever like those kind of days are in the past I feel like or at least I hope um, and that we're figuring out ways to like that 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 we're partnering and, and this is like something that I stress a lot with the film community is that we have to be building capacity um, like, you know, if, for instance, with, with Molly of Denali, it was really important to have um, capacity building opportunities at every level of production, because of course, animation was something that was new to all of us. Um, and so being able to create a screenwriting fellowship and voice acting classes, workshops um, to get people on the production side of things. So, so, and, and you can really like that can, um, I translate, I feel like into other, you know, industries and other, you know, organizations too. It's like, how are we consistently building in um, real inclusion and, and equity? Yeah. Yeah. As you said, like put them behind the camera, let's teach what, you know, if you have an expert or a professional there share share those skills out in so many ways and i i agreed because i thought they could translate to so many different aspects of what we and, all do the way we can all kind of incorporate something in and monica you are going to do like a follow-up email so we can send like links and resources and stuff okay awesome <laughs> yep and i did see someone didn't get a full catch of the film so yeah it'll be in the recording you'll get to see it um, and we will share all the links. So especially for like the Dawson City um, and other things about the film, um, promise you will you will get all of that. Um, okay, and now, I don't know, probably the part I was initially most excited about until I saw the short film, um, and we've teased it out a little bit, is Molly of Denali and really this, this hit, this absolute um, international hit that it has become um, and how, this project came to be and really what it is for those that may not be like myself and have some amazing nieces who are absolutely enthralled mm -hmm. uh, by Molly. Um, yeah, so this um, Molly's, you know, just wrapped its, you know, second season, hopefully it'll have a third season. And I came on board um, for the, at, before we, yeah, basically at the very beginning. Um, along with a really amazing, strong um, advisory group consisting of um, my cousin Rochelle Adams, um, Adeline Raboff, my mom, um, Dewey Hoffman, and our elder Luke Titus. And now we have um, Luke and Adeline have um, retired and they have their seats are now filled with um, our elder Wilson Justin and Lorraine David. So those are our new advisors. But I think 
it's critical to have our elders involved. Um, there's so many things that come up had that came up like during the show where we were able to say, hey, would it be appropriate for Raven to do this? Or <laughs> um, just like, you know, just random like things that would come up. And we just really aim for um, from the very beginning, we wanted to be as authentic as possible, but we also wanted to imbue the series with, again, our native values and, um, and I, and again, and I, when, as I mentioned before, like, I feel like when you put all that love and intention into it, you can't help but imbue some of that spirit of the people, you know, into this, this, the show. And we knew that we had this amazing opportunity to reach children and their families. And some of the most amazing anecdotes that I've heard from across the nation are when parents who are not native you know, say things like, oh, ever since my kids started watching Molly of Denali, they like go around thanking plants and animals and, <laughs> you know, having this like different relationship. And I'm like, yes, that's the whole point is that we have this certain level of, of, of reciprocity, of respect, you know, of recognizing the significance and value of our elders. Um, and that, that also, you know, one of the beautiful things I think about, the, um, the show is just having, um, Molly who is, makes mistakes, you know, she makes, you know, mistakes and then she gets to have this really loving supportive community that like gently guides her, you know, back on the right path. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been a real gift. And one of the things that if, if I highly recommend, if you haven't seen the show, um, there's a couple of like really key stories and one of them being grandpa's drum that addresses the residential schools. And I really, really, really encourage you to watch that. And it was really based on Luke's sharing his story of residential schools with us. Of course, my mother, you know, was also a survival of the re residential schools and, um, and to be able to have that be one of the first stories that we came out of the gate with, you know, at PBS was like really to me marking that we're ready to tell the true history. And, you know, Luke, you know, when we went, we're going through that process, you know, one of the things he said was when we, um, tell our true histories, then we get to heal from those histories and then we get to create the new. And Molly of Denali is about creating the new. And um, you know, also just seeing the impact of Alaska Native kids who, who watch the show and then all of a sudden they like really want to put on their cuss buck or they really want to like, you know, drum and sing. And I remember even my own boys are kind of on the shire, well, not the little ones, not shy, but the other, the middle ones, he's kind of shy. And so I just remember at the premiere, like I had never seen them, um, so into drumming and singing. And we invited all the kids on stage and they were drumming and singing so hard, even though white kids were drumming and singing <laughs> so hard. I was like, oh my gosh, this didn't happen when I was a kid. It was the opposite. It was like, there was like all this, like, you know, um, you just, there wasn't the normalization. There was like shame, you know? And so to see them was like really emotional, really emotional. And, um, yeah. And I just, you know, really, um, you know, I have such a deep, um, appreciation for the amount of work and thought that goes into children's educational programming. Yeah. A lot blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> you're like, oh, it's a kid's show. And you're just like, you have no idea what went into that. <laughs> and literally like hundreds of people, like, right. Hundreds of people touch that show in many different shapes and forms. And so it's been, um, it, it's been such a learning experience. And so I stepped down in April of last year, um, from the creative producer position, but I still write for the show and I'm on the advisory group now. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it really, it really has been amazing for a number of reasons. I think one, just generally speaking, it's hard to find kids programs that adults really do enjoy watching. And I've heard repeatedly from uh, many parents that they, when the kids get excited and want to watch that, they're absolutely more than happy to join. Um, I saw some comments about how important and um, critical it is to, to be educating kids and because it does trickle up to the parents and 
um, this show absolutely does this. And, you know, I, between not only um, having, you know, either Gwich'in or Native kids be able to watch this and see that identity and get excited for their culture again, but also, you know, hearing my niece um, say Masi Cho now. Yay. I didn't know this when I started as an adult, right? Like I didn't know a lot of these things and it's just, just the power of this, the storytelling is, um, it's incredible. And, and yeah, kids programs, educational kids programs, I think are invaluable. So we appreciate all the blood, sweat and tears. Um, but for this amazing audience of adults, we, we're going to play a short clip, but it'll be one of uh, which I think you will recognize. Um, it's just a minute long. So let me get this up and then we'll come back and be able to do some Q&A um, after this. So just a moment here. Coming to PBS Kids, the all new Molly of Denali. Safe travels! I can't wait, Mom. I can't wait! <laughs> wow, it looks so wild. Where are we? Molly, welcome to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. <gasps> I see caribou! Uh-huh, lots of unsai. What is that? A rock? Who would put a rock on a runway? Hey, can you take out the binoculars? Huh, a dingic, a monstrous moose. I'll circle the runway. That should drive them off. Molly of Denali, an all-new show coming Monday, July 15th on PBS Kids and the PBS Kids video app. So yes, a little touch of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Getting to see a moose, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> which is more exciting. Having mom, having mom fly the airplane. I mean, it's it's all those things that you really see. And um, yeah, representation on so many fronts. I just think um, it's amazing and appreciate your um, sharing it with us and, and your involvement to make sure it was done in such an important and good way. Um, and before we get into the questions that I promise, I did see a number in the chat. So thanks guys. Um, you know, we touched on this a little bit, as you mentioned, you love the title geography of hope. It was started, you know, in the pandemic that we're still in things have been crazy the last few years for a number of reasons, but it's important. It's important to have hope and it's important, um, to recognize areas that we can be hopeful in and can make change in. And so just wanted to give you a quick opportunity to talk about what you're hopeful for and what brings you hope? Oh my gosh. Um, so many things. Um, people, people give me hope. Um, our kids give me hope, the return of the sun, um, the promise of another growing short but intense growing season in Alaska. Um, I think um, all of the beautiful like stories coming out, you know, whether it's in children's literature or journalism or film, um, that all gives me hope. And just to general, thankfully, I've always remained really curious about life. And, you know, even during these times, like even with all and trust me, like my family's had some really hard times um, over the course of the last couple of years, even in that, in our sorrow and our grief, you know, in our pain, that is a part of this experience of life. We all signed up for this, you know, being human. And it comes with that myriad of experience. And so um, I just remember you know, my grandparents and the people I come from. And if you don't keep moving, you're going to die. <laughs> you got to keep moving. You got to keep active. And my personal, like, you know, spiritual foundation is one that necessitates us giving back 
And, and that can take many different shapes and forms, but being engaged with community is critical. Um, more challenging during the pandemic, but you know we find our ways to stay connected and um, and and those daily groundings um, for me are really important. Just having a little, you know, just a little time of quiet, just a little time of meditation, of prayer. Um, yeah, and and I don't watch the news. Um, I get pieces, I get enough bits and pieces of the news, um, but uh, I, I just feel like we're, we're constantly being um, sold an apocalyptic narrative. We're constantly being bombarded with kind of negativity because that's what unfortunately seems to sell. And I don't prescribe to that. I think that there's far more many people who are peace loving, who are doing beautiful, good work in the world. And that's what we need to focus on. Wonderful. Well, thank you. With that, I'm going to quickly turn it over to my colleague, Hillary, um, to just tell you all how you can get involved. And then I will be going through pulling some questions. And then Princess and I will be right back to answer them. So over to you, Hill. Hey everyone, I'm so happy to see you all here tonight. Um, Princess, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to just offer up the opportunity for everyone to help support Alaska Wilderness League's work. Right now, there, we are in a time of more hope as we're seeing progress being made to help protect some of the places that we care most about from the Arctic refuge to places in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. And we're having some outstanding victories there. Um, but there's also the problem of any kind of opportunity that they have, the oil industry will try to spin a uh, circumstance to show that they think that we need to drill more in the Arctic. And we certainly have seen that in the last month. Um, Alaska Wilderness League was disappointed, but not surprised that just you know, days after uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine, they were instantly talking about how we needed to drill in the refuge to support all of this um, oil independence. And we know that this is just not the story that we should be believing and we're gonna fight back hard against it. And so the hope for me and for Alaska Wilderness League is around the fact that this message is actually gaining momentum and people really are rejecting the oil narrative that every solution to every problem is to drill. And instead we're seeing much more voices raising up and saying, no, actually what we need to do is get independence from oil and protect the last wild places that we have. And that's what Alaska Wilderness League is trying to do. And we're fighting back to make sure that this happens. So if you wanna support that effort, um, you can go to alaskawild.org slash donate today, and we will continue to fight this fight for a long time. So thank you all. And um, I'm gonna turn it back to Monica and Princess. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Hill. Um, much appreciated. And again, we'll include all those links and yeah. Um, but again, always, you know, we see, I know Princess just got to say hi to some folks in the chat really quick. Um, same for me. It's just so nice to see um, not only so many familiar faces, um, but also just, you know, knowing how much you guys have done over the years uh, to support such a variety of efforts um, and causes that uh, are near and dear to all of us. So a big thank you. Uh, to all of you guys uh, for tonight. And yeah, hi, hi Finance, same to you. <laughs> um, okay, time for a few quick questions. Um, there were a few regarding uh, the Gwich'in and the connection to the caribou, which was really touched on and emphasized in the short film. Um, just wondering if you could kind of expand on that a little bit, um, maybe about um, just what it, what it meant and, and what you were trying to convey in the film. Um, yeah, I mean, some of you might know that um, there's actually an amazing book um, called Dinjivats I Vitlit, and that's the man who became a caribou um, that um, Kenneth Frank and 
um, Craig Mishler worked on, which is such a gift, but that's based on one of our, you know, traditional stories of a man, a Gwich'in man who became a Vatsai and he lived among the Vatsai and they taught him um, um, how they wanted to be treated and respected, um, what they ate, where they migrated. Um, and then he turned back into a man and they said that for months after that, he would be throwing up the lichen, which is, you know, their food source. Um, and, and that we dream to the caribou. And so I think that, you know, part of our, um, if you really look at the origin of our, you know, so many of our traditional stories, um, we were able to speak to the animals and become, do this like shape-shifting and that's how um, strong our tie was, our spiritual tie was and is, you know, to the animals. Um, so that's something that, you know, we, we actually use some of that interview in the short film where we say, you know, it's not just that, uh, it's reciprocal, our relationship with the but I, and I think, you know, there's no greater um, issue where that becomes prevalent than, you know, our long, long history now of trying to protect the caribou from oil development. We have this obligation, you know, just as we defend and protect um, our own children, you know, our fate is tied to the Vatsai, to the caribou. And so um, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> No, that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I'm really excited that you brought up The Man Who Became Caribou and the book. Um, Judith actually had a question way at the beginning um, regarding titles of books and other medium that could help um, just someone who's interested in learning more. <laughs> Look at that. This wasn't planned. Judith wasn't a plant. Um, yeah. her... So that's great. Kat, thanks for sharing the link in the chat. We'll make sure it goes in that email as well. Um, we have a few books at Alaska Wilderness League have, that we have read and discovered through some of our partners. But yeah, I just wanted to give you the opportunity, Princess, in case you had other thoughts um, on books or a medium to share, because um, we're always interested in learning more. Um, yeah, I guess it just depends on like, you know, what do you want to learn about if it's... <laughs> You know, Finnis has a new book. <laughs> um, so I guess it's like if it's on like this issue, um, the Alaska Native Language Center is a great resource for a lot of books on our traditional stories as well. I know. And I was going to I was going to show Finnis's book. It's currently helping me get a little more elevation on my laptop because it's been on my desk because it's amazing. Um, and if you missed it, um, I did. We did get to do a geography of hope with. Oh, good. Um, but it's it really talks about the history of the Arctic refuge issue and how um, was it not for the leadership of the Gwich'in, um, how we would not be in a place where we could even still be talking about its protection today, um, even in the face of so many um, challenges and just how their story and their efforts really inspired a grassroots you know, nation to, to stand up. Um, and so, we will we'll include some of those links, but thank you for also the Alaska Language Center. Yeah, I can't underscore enough um, how much um, gratitude I have in my heart for um, all of our community members that continue to make that long kind of arduous trip to DC and to really, you know, raise their voices up because um, it takes a toll. I think it's pretty taxing, you know, on the spirit. Like I said, you know, it's like, we have, um, you know, our joy and um, our hope and all those things. And it just takes um, for a community such as ours that are still trying to heal from historical traumas to then continuously um, fight to validate and defend who we are as a people and our way of life is um, unjustified. It's really, it shouldn't be that way. Um, and we all know this. I mean, I'm kind of, you know, we all know this. <laughs> we shouldn't. So, you know, continue to kind of keep um, uplift um, Bernadette and, and, you know, those that are that are making that trip and doing the work, um, holding them up in prayer and, you know, just supporting everybody who 
you know, is continuing to fight the good fight, you know, and like I said, you know, we do that through different avenues, you know, for me, I, I feel like storytelling is, is my, you know, the avenue that I've chosen, you know, for myself and maybe it was more chosen, you know, for me, but I think that we, we all have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, without storytelling in any of its form, I don't think we'd be where we are not only with just the refuge, but so many of our issues. If we can't, if we can't make that connection with others and share things that are different in a way that's understood, um, we'd be much worse off. So um, I am thankful for storytellers because I am surely not one of them. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we're all storytellers. <laughs> possibly, um, just different kinds of stories. Um, maybe you're significantly more interesting. Um, there was a question, um, about tra tra your, uh, traditional tattooing. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to share a little bit about that, um, and kind of what it is in, in a cultural sense. Yeah. I mean, generally, um, I don't always share, but I think what I will say, you know, in this space is that, um, you know, I was, you know, brought up in a very, again, uh, lack of representation, a Western standard of beauty of, I mean, I remember going to my mom when I was like five and being like, why do I have dark skin and dark hair? Like, I wish I had blonde hair and blue eyes because that was the standard, you know, of beauty in this country and who was accepted. And so for me, um, the reclamation of our traditional tattoos is a rejection of a colonist mindset and, you know, way in which we have been, you know, viewed or, you know, looked down upon. Um, and it's a, you know, real reclaiming of, um, you know, who we are and, you know, walking in a way that is deeply rooted in our own um, indigenous worldview and value system. And so I think, you know, for most of us that have, you know, now reclaimed this traditional practice, it's like, it's deeply personal, but that's what I will share about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I know it is extremely personal, but I appreciate just even the, the oversight. I think it's, um, important for a lot of us to hear and um, start understanding. And so wrapping up, because this, we could we could converse for um, a long time. I just want, you know, what's next? What's big? I mean, we've got, you've got this film, it's going to go through the film circuit. It's going to get a lot of accolades. I have no doubt. You've got Molly. Um, so what are you excited for next? Yeah, I'm working on a lot of different projects. Um, one of them is a collaboration between Native Movement and the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition Interfaith Group. Um, we're doing a series of interviews um, exploring the ways faith and or spirituality move um, a community or a person to action. Um, so the intersection really of faith and, and or democracy. And, um, you know, it's been really amazing. Just we've we, we're completed two of the interviews um, and kind of like this Geography of Hope um, series as well. It's like, I think, um, you know, what moves us to act in community is usually re rooted in some um, deeper meaning to ourselves personally and higher purpose that maybe we don't share often with other people but that I think is important to share. So I'm working on that. And then um, I'm also working on a video, my husband and I are also working on a just transition and what that looks like in indigenous led um, just transition in the state of Alaska with the just transition um, members of the collective group up here. So I'm excited about that. And then I have, um, you know, um, my other, um, more Hollywood projects, I guess, <laughs> that I'm also excited about, but which I have, I'm, I'm not privy to share at this point, but yeah. <laughs> it's a perfect tease to end on. I, I couldn't think of a better Hollywood ending. It's making everyone stay tuned. Um, yeah. We're going to be hearing a lot, lot more of Princess. I have no doubt. Um, so yes, with everything going on, Princess, I can't thank you enough for taking the time um, to join us on Geography of Hope and share these projects. 
Um, it really was a, an amazing learning and just emotionally like rich, enriching experience um, for all of us. I've seen the comments just be flying through that everyone really, really enjoyed it. So um, a huge thank you to you for joining us and a big thanks to everyone uh, that tuned in tonight. Um, stay tuned for that email. We appreciate you guys uh, joining us session after session. And we look forward to seeing you the next one. So thank you all and have a great evening. Masicho, Koyana, Gunashchish. Merci, gracias. <laughs> thank you for having me. And I hope we're all asking ourselves daily, what are those things that give us hope and that we're also finding a little bit of joy, just a little bit of joy every single day is so important. So, masik. <laughs>